Welcome to Universal Man, where we turn your flight into fight so that you can master yourself and conquer your goals. My name is Mark Weppet, and I'm here to help you sharpen your masculine edge so that you can cut through the resistance that's holding you back and keeping you from showing up on the front lines of life and being a man that you admire. And today I'm back with another episode of the Sexual Self Mastery series. And in this one, it's going to be a kind of a different topic. Um, some of you might think it's a little strange, but to be honest with you, it's probably one of the most powerful perspectives that I've ever come across. And the people that I teach it to and implement it, they see drastic changes in their behavior and motivation to improve their life. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is taking an old school perspective of spiritual warfare uh, and updating it for the modern man. Uh, to take it kind of out of this sort of Middle Ages, Dark Ages sort of thing and uh, allow you to really adopt a mental model that will help you tap into more psychological and emotional power. You know, I've talked about using a combat mentality uh, before about how to tap into your natural aggressive uh, instincts and energies to engage in personal change. And that's really what this is for. It's, it's, it's a tool designed to help you become more powerful, more clear, and more effective. <laughs> Most guys struggle to quit porn because they aren't building the right habits to replace porn. If you want to learn the simple habit replacement system I've used to help thousands of men quit porn and develop self-mastery, then click the link in the description below and download my free Reboot Regimen guide. So before I get into the specifics of this technique, I want to talk about the problem that it really solves. Okay, And when it comes to personal transformation, I think one of the biggest things that people struggle with is that they forget what they're doing. <laughs> they like, you know, especially around the realm of sexuality, especially around the realm of developing sexual self-mastery, okay? Like if you're trying to quit porn, one of the things that you're going to struggle with is that you're going to get a craving to watch porn or, you know, fantasize about sex or whatever. And it's just going to feel like no big deal. It's like, yeah, why not? Why wouldn't I do that? You know, like it's not a problem. It's not going it, to, it, everyone does it. It's not going to cause like my world to collapse right now. It's, you know, just, it's okay. Right. <laughs> and the thing is, this is just not an accurate depiction of your reality, especially if you've understood and you've looked at honestly how this habit of porn addiction or sexually acting out like whatever it is that you're struggling with if you've identified that that stuff's ruining your life well then the problem is that you keep telling yourself that it's not and you tell, give yourself permission to engage in it right and i think in part this is because our brain is not so great at dealing with abstract threats okay so let me let me make a uh, let me do an example here. OK, so imagine that there was a person who was trying to cause all of the problems that an unresolved porn addiction uh, causes in your life. There's one person they were trying to give you sexual dysfunction. They were trying to ruin your romantic relationships. They were trying to steal your motivation and, you know, keep it so that you can't get fired up about life. You can't get motivated. You can't get interested and passionate about things because your neurochemistry is off and you're wasting all your time and energy uh, watching porn and jerking off. Okay. Imagine that there was a person that was trying to do all of that to you. How would you feel toward that person? How would you interact with them? Would you invite them over like a friend and say, hey, yeah, come on into my house. Yeah, tell me what you think. No, you would hate this person. You would react very violently, very probably viscerally to this person. And you would hate them and you would reject everything that they try to send you away because you know that they're trying to ruin your life. The thing is, we don't respond like that to our porn addictions for the most part, right? Uh, we just like in the moments that we're triggered, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, porn, it's an old friend. It's a buddy. He's always been there for me. He's always here to pick me up when things are down or when I'm bored or when I'm upset or whatever. He's, he's always there for me. He's a good guy. You know, that's what we do. We don't treat that problem like the threat that it is. Why? I think it's just because we have trouble, like I said, wrapping our head around something that's kind of more abstract and amorphous like a psychological sort of issue is. So that's where this perspective of spiritual warfare comes into play. And it's something that I think we we understood as humans 
hundreds of years ago, uh, there were some problems with our understanding. And then because of those problems, we essentially abandoned something that was, for the most part, actually very effective in modifying our behavior and helping us to behave virtuously. So let's take a little backtrack through time. All right, let's take a little little history detour to see how some of our ancestors behave. Now, there's a lot of um, different religions and traditions that have a spiritual lens, a lot of them. But I'm, I'm going to look at the Christian one because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So, you know, if we go back to a time where belief in God and belief in the devil was more popular than, you know, a belief in mathematics, well, how did that person live? How did they interact with the world? Well, a lot of times they saw not just the material world as it was, they saw a spiritual world too. Instead of just seeing an addiction, they saw a possession. They saw an evil spirit. They saw, you know, the spiritual world everywhere. They saw angels and demons on every corner. And this was because of the prevalence of the church and these kinds of ideas. And I think that this is actually a very effective perspective because you can attach a face or uh, you can personify the problems. And what this does is I think it gives your brain more to latch onto. It allows your brain to engage your threat mechanisms when confronted by a situation. So this old school, middle ages, dark ages Christian, when they were tempted, you know, they saw the devil there. You know, they used their imagination to imagine this, this spirit there tempting them. And if they could see it for what it was and name it, uh, they could call down this holy fire upon it and rebuke this this demon, right? And I think a lot of times, like, yeah, there was plenty of people who were super, you know, non-virtuous and whatever. But I think there was also a lot of faith and a lot of piety uh, throughout different points of history, especially due to religious devotion of many people. And so when you see that demon <laughs> tempting you, rather than just hearing the the, the, the the sensations, you know, the craving and not questioning it, seeing it as an old friend or seeing it as something benign, you see an epic struggle between good and evil that you are literally participating in. You see yourself as uh, an agent who can either bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God, or you see someone who is, you know, you're taking the path of being someone who supports Satan and his reign over the world. And, you know, this kind of epic lens, I think <laughs> it does a lot for you because it engages more of your brain instead of just seeing some kind of abstract situation, you see a real threat. And this, I think, neurochemically makes a big difference because it, I think it does actually trigger your fight or flight mechanisms. So, you know, for example, if you think of a highly triggering situation, um, you know, without this spiritual warfare mentality, you might see it as, ah, you know, I could go to a strip club or whatever. That could be, that could be pretty fun. You know, that could be, you know, there could be a lot of, a lot of sexy ladies there and whatever. And it might sound tempting. You apply the spiritual warfare lens. It's like, oh my gosh, that's like a den of demons. <laughs> Maybe I should be a little afraid of that. Maybe I should engage my flight mechanism and not go there because those things, that whole idea around the addiction, it does want to destroy you. It does want to ruin your life. You know, I ask guys who are my clients, I'm like, what will happen in your life if you let this uh, addiction to, to lust and sexual indulgence take over? What will happen? Every single one of them describes a terrible life. Like this thing, you know, and it does seem to have a kind of intelligence to it. It's, there's so many different tendrils of the addiction, like the society, the, the 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 popular beliefs in the world, the the media, the you know search for money of, of the pornographers and women trying to sell their body, and all the complex stuff that is there combines to create something that has an, something like an intelligence, right? And it manifests these rationalizations as to why it's okay. And so, like you know, treat this thing like the enemy it is. Give it the respect that it's due. See it as the demon that does want to steal your soul. Like, you know, this is not a new concept. Like the whole idea around the sirens, right? The, the mythological creature, like those mermaid creatures. They're so beautiful and they would entice the sailors. And when the sailor would jump in because they were just wanted to make love to these sirens, the sirens, what would they do? They would drown them. 
right? Or the idea of a, a succubus, that's a type of demon, a female shaped demon that, you know, tries to entice men and steal their soul. Well, I mean, these things exist. You can see metaphorically, or, you know, if you really want to take the spiritual thing all the way, you can see them as real entities. It's just applying a different name to them. So by seeing threats and engaging the flight mechanism when appropriate, well, that'll just allow you to stay away from things that, you know, will trigger you, right? That'll, uh, you know, you don't want to purposely expose yourself to situations where you're going to have a lot of these demons piled up on top of you and modifying your thinking in a way that's going to negatively influence your ability to make good decisions, right? But I would say even more importantly is that through using this perspective, you can use it to engage your fight mechanism, not just your flight mechanism, your, your, fl your fight mechanism is what's most essential here because you can't live your life in fear. You can't live your life in fear of seeing a, you know, sexual image. You can't live your life in fear of like what a woman's going to wear walking down the street. So yeah, stay away from te uh, tempting things or, you know, things that you know would trigger you in a way that would be unhelpful. But more than that, you have to be able to know that when these things come up, that you can dismantle them, that you can see them for the evil that they are and violently reject them. So instead of coming home and seeing that computer as just, ah, oh, it's just a, you know, a hunk of plastic and metal with some electricity flowing through it. And, you know, maybe I could, you know, use it to enjoy some sexy pictures of some women and it's no big deal. It's not going to hurt. No one's going to know. Instead, you see it as a portal. You see the, the demon sitting there on the table enticing you, trying to pull you in like those sirens to essentially consume you and ruin your life. Because like we said, it will do that if you let it. So see it for what it is and let yourself get pissed off about it. Let yourself, uh, you know, rain down some of that holy fire. And what I think that really means is, you know, th that old school spiritual perspective, it's like prayer, right? Prayer. What, well, what does that mean? What is prayer about? Prayer is about connecting you to your highest conception of goodness. This is about this aligned self-talk that I've been talking about nonstop in this series. You got to be able to connect yourself to something good. And it's this submission to this higher image, this higher ideal. That's what prayer is. That's what spirituality is. And that's what you need to do. And a huge part of that is channeling all that negative energy toward negative things. You know, I think people have this idea that a, a spiritually enlightened person is someone who doesn't have any negative energy inside them. That like, you know, personal development is just becoming, like removing your anger and your uh, dislike for things and just living in just peace and joy and whatever. And I don't really think that's the case. I think we humans, we naturally got some violent, dark, aggressive stuff inside of us and you can't get it out of us. It's just, that's the way we're wired. The best thing you can do is to integrate it and line it up so that the bad part, the bad parts, the aggressive, you know, violent parts of yourself point toward bad things. And so this is an attempt to do this, this lens of spiritual warfare of seeing the demons that exist in your life as enemies to reject and put down. That's what this is about. And hopefully it can help you. And I know personally for me and for the people I've talked to about this, it creates a real neurochemical change when you start applying this thing. You can feel the adrenaline. You can feel the aggression. It's like a, from what I understand of the neurochemistry, it's kind of like a combination between adrenaline, testosterone, and vasopressin that gives you this feeling of kind of like righteous power. And if you've ever, um, you know, got really indignant with someone for treating you poorly or whatever, well, you know, you know that feeling, that feeling of kind of that, that fire, that fight. And that makes it so much easier to quit porn if you have that rather than like, ah, oh, I got this old friend and he's here and he's like offering me this fun time. And like, I think I'm not supposed to do it, but like, oh, it feels so good. Instead, you're just like, away from me, Satan, right? <laughs> so here's how I've been thinking about it recently. My wife, she's pregnant with, uh, we found out with a little girl and we're really excited about it. And you know, just thinking about this whole porn situation in context of becoming a father and trying to personify that problem. It's like this spirit of pornography. What does it want? If it was a person, well, what it would want to do is it would want to turn me into a pervert who, you know, 
would use women and devalue them and just be unfaithful to my wife and all that kind of stuff. But I'd also want to turn my wife and my daughter into a whore uh, who's insecure uh, in her own self, feeling like the only value that she has is the sexual pleasure that men can derive from her and wants to ruin her chances at having happiness in a fulfilling relationship. And like, if there was an actual person that was trying to do that, to specifically to me and to my wife and to my daughter, I would react as violently as you possibly could to that person. Probably, you know, I mean, <laughs> hopefully I'd be able to stay out of jail. But like, you, you see what I mean? Like there's a, there's a, Ooh, no, you're not going to do that to me. You're not going to do that to my family. But yet we let problems like that run in our life all the time because we don't name them for the evil that they are. And I think in some ways this is tied to, this notion you see in Catholic exorcisms where they always try where they can to get the name of the spirit. And I think this is illustrative of a greater metaphysical principle where if you can name the evil, if you can name the problem, then you have some power over it. But if you can't, if you don't identify the evil, well, then all of a sudden, you know, you have way less power over it. And I think this also goes with the old Catholic sentiment, or I guess maybe it's just a Christian one, where like the greatest uh, like lie that Satan ever convinced the world of is that he doesn't exist. And I, I can't help but agree with that, both, you know, like even if it's just on a philosophical, you know, uh, rational level, is that if you do not name evil, if you think that it doesn't exist, well, then you are completely powerless to it. So before you go and grab your your pitchforks and go to war or whatever uh, against the, the evils in your life, there does need to be some nuance added here because, you know, you got to ask yourself, if this mentality is so effective, why has why it fallen out of favor? Um, well, beyond just a more rational materialist worldview, which, um, you know, invalid, it seems to make swallowing this whole idea as complete truth, not just as metaphorical truth, more difficult. I think it's also that the, it's the use of this mentality that has been used to justify some very bad actions, right? Like you can think of, you know, the Spanish Inquisition where they would torture people, um, you know, for sometimes no good reason or, uh, you know, the Salem witch trials and, and that kind of stuff where people would attack essentially the wrong thing. They would apply this uh, spiritual warfare to something and they would call something evil that wasn't actually evil, <laughs> right? And so you really want to avoid this. And so the, the thing that's important to keep clear here, here is the distinction between what you're fighting against and what you're fighting for. And this is a little bit nuanced, all right? So the evil thing here, the, the spirit of the evil spirit is really the lie, right? It's the deception, it's the, the thing that you're acting on that is simply not true. So the fundamental lie uh, that an addict faces is that I should do this, it would be good. Or that it's okay to do this and because it won't do anything bad to me or whatever. These are the lies because the truth is, all right, this is bad for me. If I do this, it will hurt me in the long run. It is a net loss in pleasure and satisfaction in life. And then we tell ourselves alive that that's not the truth, <laughs> right? We say, hey, no, it's totally cool or oh, it's fine, whatever. So the lie is the thing you want to fight against. The thing, <laughs> it gets tricky though, because your emotions get caught up in the lie. Your emotions are not evil. The story that your emotions tell may be evil. <laughs> and so the thing that you need to balance here is the compassion for the part of you that is caught in the deception. All right, because sometimes you're going to be really hurting. You're going to be really struggling. You're going to be feeling really down. You're going to be feeling like you really want this thing. OK, and so the, the image that I like to use uh, is like imagine that you've got a kid all right, and your kid got addicted to drugs all right, because there's a neighborhood drug dealer got them hooked and you didn't know what was going on. And so your kid got addicted. And so you're trying to love your kid. Your kid's sitting there craving, crying for their drugs on the floor. Are you going to give them the drugs? No, because you love them and you're going to show them tough love. But you're also not going to hate your kid for being addicted. You're going to hate the drug deal dealer that told them that it's okay and gave them that kind of thing, right? So the 
<laughs> the drug dealer here represents the lie, all right? And that lie has some influence over your kid, which is essentially kind of like your emotional aspect. And so love your emotional aspect, care for it, but really care for it. Give it the things that are going to set it free and help it get through the problem. It's like, no, hey, man, you're not, I'm not going to give you your drugs. Uh, <laughs> instead, what we're going to do maybe is we're going to go for a walk. I'm going to talk this over with you. I'm going to tell you how much better your life's going to be if you get on the other side of this. But, you know, <laughs> as soon as the lies start coming up, you got to respond with truth. That's how you fight this battle, right? And in the areas of like the Inquisition and the Salem witch trials, they, they lost focus on the truth. And so they became instruments of evil. The truth is always where it's at. And so whenever you're struggling with one of these demons, one of these temptations or whatever, that's what you want to be focusing on more than anything. And I, I recommend even keeping a log of this kind of stuff. You know, you can scan your days and figure out, all right, today I swallowed this lie at this point, you know, and here's the truth that I should have been operating on. Every single time you make a bad decision, unless if it's just due to pure ignorance, if you make a bad decision, it's because you swallowed some lie in the moment, which means that you got your head twisted by some kind of demon, all right? And the more you can name these lies and identify what the true statement is, the more free you're gonna become. So that's what I have for you guys today. A little bit of a different sort of video. I know I kind of rambled a little bit, so hopefully it was still, you're still able to follow it and get some value from it. Like I said, it can be very powerful, um, and I've seen a lot of success when using it. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. So stay sharp. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, if you found this episode useful and you want to hear more, make sure you like, subscribe, and if you're tuning in on YouTube, make sure you hit that bell button to turn on notifications. But if you really like this content and you would like to join the tribe of Universal Men, then you need to head on over to the Universal Man Patreon page by clicking the link in the description. We call ourselves the Vanguard because we are committed to living on the front lines of life. By joining, you will gain access to exclusive content, weekly accountability, community chat rooms, and live calls. Also, by joining the Vanguard, you become a part of my inner circle. Therefore, you get my prioritized attention. Most importantly, though, you'll be joining a crew of like-minded guys that can help support and inspire you on your journey of masculine self-mastery. So click the link below and sign up today.